May I speak in the name of our loving, liberating, and life-giving God. Amen. Please be seated. I've always appreciated a great movie with a surprise ending. Not just an unexpected plot twist, but the kind of revelation that makes you think, I absolutely have to watch this whole movie over again right now to see how much I missed the first time through. I'm thinking of films like The Sixth Sense, where the main character, a psychologist trying to treat a young boy who believes he sees ghosts, turns out to be himself a ghost. Or Fight Club, where the two protagonists, played by Brad Pitt and Edward Norton, end up being the same person. Films like Planet of the Apes, Memento, The Village, Arrival, even the recent Disney hit Moana. I love that moment when something unexpected falls into place and just fits, and suddenly everything that came before it looks different. It's amazing, exciting, alarming to realize how the subtlest shift can dramatically change an entire story. I wonder if that's a bit like what Peter, John, and James felt on the mountaintop when they saw Jesus transfigured before them, saw him conversing with Moses and Elijah, representing the law and the prophets, heard God's own voice crying, this is my son, my chosen. Think what a mind-bender it was the first time you heard a similar revelation, Luke, I am your father. I wonder if the disciples pulled their robe up to their chin, thinking, I did not see that coming, and whispered to each other the equivalent of, it was earth all along. After all, the disciples are only just getting to know Jesus. Up until this point in their experience, he had been wandering the Galilean countryside, teaching and healing, clearly a person of great power and compassion, But his disciples are only just beginning to see him as the anointed one, only just beginning to understand why he has come and what he must do. Sure, locked away somewhere in the recesses of their memory, there's something about a Messiah coming, something about the descendants of David. But until now, there were only glimmers and hints that Jesus might somehow even fit into that narrative. And suddenly, surprise, He is the key to the entire production. To appreciate the scene, we have to remember that for ancient Jews, a mountaintop was a holy place of communion with God. It was on the mountain that God gave Moses the commandments. It was in a mountain cave that God spoke to Elijah, not in wind, earthquake, and fire, but in a still, small voice within, a gentle whisper. We tend to think of drawing closer to God as an altogether positive thing, but the early Israelites felt much more ambivalence about this. After delivering them from bondage in Egypt and bringing them into the wilderness, God tried to talk directly to all the people, but they found it so terrifying that they begged God to speak with Moses as a mediator. We heard in our first reading that Moses' face would shine when he went up to talk to God, And the people found even this so alarming that they asked him to cover his face so that they would not have to bear his glorious glow. So Jesus takes his three closest disciples with him up to a mountain to pray. And while he prays, his face changes and his clothes become dazzling white. This is not the light of a bright summer day falling upon his rugged brown flesh. It is a light radiating outward from within like a lamp shining in a dark place, as Peter puts it, like a beacon of hope, of liberation, of redemption. Interestingly, Luke tells us that the disciples were weighed down with sleep and only managed to see all this because they happened to stay awake. They could have missed it, Luke is saying. They could have snoozed right through this critical scene, this incredible moment of revelation a moment that would force them to look back on the last few months and years walking and learning and healing with their friend and realize they had been all along in the company of God's own son. It could have passed them by entirely. Maybe there's a bit of a warning here for us from Luke. Don't let it pass you by. Stay awake. 
pay attention. Just as they're about to leave, Peter stammers out a suggestion. Let's build three dwellings, one for each of you. Perhaps in his shock, he can think of nothing better than to offer them something, like a home, a place of rest. Perhaps in his awe, he is looking for a way to hold on to the moment, to contain it. Perhaps in his fear, he is hoping for a way to keep this locked up, high on the peak, at a safe distance away. And then, if the disciples weren't already shaking in their sandals, a cloud moves in and overshadows them, just as it always did when Moses was conversing with Yahweh. And now they are well and truly terrified, as a voice speaks from the cloud, announcing, This is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. Listen to him. It is an awesome moment. The kind of moment that might make you want to set the site aside, like Peter, and put up walls, build an altar, light some candles, install a cross and some pews, and dress in fancy, strange clothes. It's the kind of moment that makes us want to worship Jesus. But importantly, this is not what God tells the disciples to do. God does not say, this is my son, my beloved, bow down and worship him. Instead, God says, listen, listen. Now, if we can restrain ourselves from falling down at Jesus' feet, if we can come to this surprising plot twist and manage to stay upright, what do we hear? It's probably not in the wind or the earthquake or the fire, not being shouted from the clouds, but the still, small voice is unmistakable, the gentle, persistent whisper echoing within, follow me, follow me. Vincent Harding was born in 1931 in Harlem, New York. After graduating from high school in the Bronx, he completed his BA in history at City College of New York and his master's in journalism at Columbia University. He then served the army for a few years and by 1956 had earned a second master's in history at the University of Chicago, where he went on to earn his PhD. No small feat for an African-American man of that time. Harding was not only a keen intellect, but a deeply faithful Christian. In 1960, he and his wife moved to Atlanta, Georgia, where they founded an interracial voluntary service center rooted in the Mennonite tradition which became a hub for civil rights leaders and learners in Georgia. Throughout the 1960s, the Hardings traveled about the South working as counselors and activists, and Vincent eventually became a speechwriter for the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Harding later made his career as a professional storyteller, a professor at prestigious universities, an inspiring author, and founder of the Veterans of Hope Project in Denver which brings together elders from the civil rights movement with young people who are continuing to advocate for social change. In one of his last interviews before his death in 2014, Harding shared a story about a young man he'd met in the 1980s in a tough part of Boston. The teen was deeply involved in the drug trade in that city and felt trapped, hopeless, like there was no way out for him into a better, or even just a different life. He spoke to Harding at length about the deep, deep darkness around all the young, poor men of color like himself, and the sense that what he needed most, and what he thought other youth like him needed most, were live human signposts, lights to light up their neighborhoods and their lives. Harding criticized the idea so prevalent in our society that the goal of education or prosperity is to figure out how we can get out of our darkness as quickly as possible, when what is needed for the transformation may be transfiguration of so many lives, so many neighborhoods, so many broken parts of the world, is a willingness not to run from the shadows, but to shine in the darkness, to be, in his words, the candles, the signposts, for one another. Listen to him, the voice from the cloud commanded. 
And what does he say? Do not be afraid. Follow me. Your sins are forgiven. Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Give to everyone who begs from you. Do to others as you would have them do to you. Be merciful. Do not judge. Do not condemn. Feed the hungry. Give drink to the thirsty. Welcome the stranger. Clothe the naked. Visit the prisoner. It's hard to do any of this from the safe distance of the mountain peak. We are children of a God who humbly entered our sorrows and our joys in Jesus, called to follow the one who came down from the heights to live and love and learn alongside us, illuminating the darkness of disappointment and exploitation, of loneliness and despair, of illness and grief, and who asks us to do the same. Listen to him, because this is a story with the most surprising ending of all. Not the pain of the cross, the glory of the resurrection, the hope of the ascension, but the shocking revelation that there is no ending at all. No limit to God's love, no distance God will not go for us, no darkness Jesus will not alight. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thank you.